Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on today's installment of the Reorg webinar series. Today we'll discuss the recent Chapter 11 filing of rental car company Hertz. I'm Nick Williams, moderator for today's webinar. Leading today's discussion are America's core credit distressed debt analyst, Yash Chanduru, and distressed debt legal analyst, Sean Daly. Please note that if you'd like to revisit this webinar later, a replay of today's discussion will be available on the Reorg Media page within 24 hours. Today, we will provide an overview of the company, the events leading to the bankruptcy filing, and highlights from the first day hearing, with a particular focus on some of the complexities inherent in Hertz capital structure. We will answer questions at the end of the presentation, so please feel free to submit your questions at any time using the Q&A widget, which is located on the left-hand side of your screen. Let's get started. Thank you for that introduction, Nick. So I'm going to start off and briefly just touch on Hertz's business and how it got to where it is today. And as you can see on the slide, Hertz has four primary business operations, if you will. The first is what we're all familiar with, vehicle rentals both in the U.S. and internationally. The second um, is vehicle dispositions, which is uh, quite an important part, which we'll get into a little bit later. Third is fleet leasing and management, which is done through its Donlin subsidiary. And finally, it's franchise locations, which are primarily in Latin America and Asia. And a key aspect of Hertz's business is uh, airports, because roughly two-thirds of their rental locations are located on airport premises, and obviously in recent times, that's uh, been a significant drag for them. And another important aspect to touch on is the distinction between program vehicles and non-program vehicles. And what a program vehicle is, is essentially one that, an agreement that Hertz enters into with uh, vehicle manufacturers that, pursuant to which they guarantee a certain level of depreciation and Hertz would not be on the hook for any further um, residual declines that are greater than, greater than expected. And so briefly touching on earnings, the company started the year with some positive momentum, and in its first quarter earn earnings, they said that year-to-date February revenue was up 8% year-over-year in the U.S. However, after the pandemic took hold, the company's transaction days and utilizations were decimated, and the first quarter resulted in a 9% year-over-year decline in the U.S. and a 15% year-over-year decline internationally. And in April specifically, according to the declaration of the CFO, global revenue was down 73% year-over-year. And so as you can see on the slide, uh, Towards the end of April, the company decided to skip a $389.5 million payment, which was um, on its ABS structure, including base rent and mark-to-market payments, which we'll get into a little bit later. So after they failed to enter this, uh, sorry, make this payment, they entered a five-day grace period and a subsequent forbearance agreement and waivers with certain first lien corporate debt creditors and ABS creditors, both domestically and internationally. And this ended up expiring on May 22nd, which is the petition date. So moving on to financials, I, I don't want to go into too much detail on the historicals, but we've laid out some key financial and operating metrics here. And more detail can be found in our tear sheet, which is available on the REORG website. Um, just kind of briefly discussing the financial history, the company has had some struggles with growing revenue revenue and profitability in 2016 and 2017 as it was dealing with issues due to its uh, fleet mix and also facing pressures from the boom in ride-sharing companies. However, they invested a lot in refleeting and introducing more luxury vehicles into, into their offering and also dedicated a certain portion of their fleet to ride-share drivers that were looking to rent vehicles. In 2019, in the U.S., Roughly 8% of the domestic fleet was dedicated to rentals for rideshare workers. And while the vehicle rental business is pretty seasonal, with the third quarter typically being the strongest 
due to consumers taking advantage of summer holidays and Q1 and Q4 being softer due to less travel during winter months. The Donlin business, which again is its fleet leasing and management, uh, it, it's relatively stable year-round, even though much smaller on a revenue basis and EBITDA basis. Um, but they post pretty consistent EBITDA margins in the 10 to 14% range, while the vehicle rental is much more prone to seasonal fluctuation than profitability. Again, don't want to get into too much of the nitty-gritty here, but just wanted to highlight one of the ways to look at Herbst's business model. And we can essentially break it down into two components. One is the rental side, which is the consumer-facing side, and the other is the vehicle financing side, which we'll get into some more detail later. So how we've broken it down here um, on the top is starting with the company's EBITDA by segment, less corporate expenses, and then we take out non-vehicle capital expenditures and cash interest, which would be related to its corporate debt, and add back the charges for vehicle financings, which include payments on the depreciation of those vehicles and charges to lease them from affiliates. And it also includes, sorry, we also add back uh, interest expense on these vehicle financings. So this gets us to an illustrative cash flow on just the rental aspect of the business. Then on the financing side, at the bottom, we use cash interest paid on vehicle debt and the cash paid for vehicle depreciation and lease expenses to estimate the cash outflow from the financing side of the business. And that lets us get to an illustrative net cash flow. And again, as you can see here, the third quarter is the strongest and often subsidizes the cash outflow in other quarters. And if you want more details on this, uh, it can be accessed via our tear sheet. And I also want to add that this excludes kind of the effects of Hertz selling its vehicles into the used car market, which we'll also get into a little bit more detail later. Now, moving on to the organizational structure, as you can see here, it's definitely hard to read and a little um, complicated, but just wanted to take the time to broadly describe this. As you can see at the top, that's the ultimate parent Holdco, Hertz Global Holdings, and then there's the Intermediate Holdco, and then the Hertz Corporation. And Towards the bottom right, you can see the company's, some of the other debtor affiliates, which are related to its dollar and uh, thrifty businesses. And also wanted to highlight towards the left, uh, John Arrow to HVF2, which is one of its um, ABS financing entities, non-debtor, um, but there are certain intercompany transactions which will be described in a bit more detail later. And then also highlighted HFLF, which is the Donlin ABS entity. And towards the middle, you can see uh, we've highlighted HHN, which is Hertz Holdings Netherlands. And that is the entity um, which has issued Hertz's Euro notes. And also, the rest of its European entities and European ABS structure is housed in subsidiaries underneath. And clearly, you can see um, those entities, the international ones, are also non debtors. All right, now moving on to the company's capital structure. We've started here by showing uh, just the company's corporate debt, which, as you can see, as of the petition date, amounts to just under $4.4 billion. And most of this is comprised of its unsecured notes. Um, but the company also has a first lien revolver, which is uh, pretty much maxed out as of the petition date, as well as a first lien term loan and second lien secured notes. Now moving on to the ABS portion of the company's capital structure. And I want to make clear that these securities are issued out of non-debtor special purpose entities, um, which we'll describe via diagram uh, in a couple slides. Um, but this is definitely the largest portion of the company's capital structure. And in the U.S. specifically, uh, Hertz has roughly $12.5 billion of vehicle-related ABS securities. And of that, the largest portion comes out of its HVF2 US ABS program, which accounts for roughly $11 billion in vehicle debt. And this is split uh, between variable funding notes, or VFNs, and medium-term notes, or MTNs. 
as you can see, the VFNs account for about $4.9 billion of the debt as of the petition date, and the MTNs account for roughly $6 billion. <clears throat> and also in the U.S., Herbs has a Donlin ABS program, which accounts for about $1.6 billion of vehicle debt, um, roughly $500 million of which are VFNs, and roughly $1.1 billion of which are MTNs. In the U.S., the Hertz also has uh, a vehicle RCF, and internationally, Hertz has roughly uh, $2.2 billion of international um, debt, and about $800 million of that is related to its euro notes, which um, were announced at the first day hearing that they entered into waivers until September 30th, and the remaining roughly $1.4 billion is related to its international vehicle debt. So as we've kind of repeatedly been alluding to, and as you'll see on the next slide, Hertz finances its vehicles via financing entities, which then transfer those proceeds to special purpose entities that purchase the vehicles, and then transfer the right of use of those vehicles to operating subsidiaries. And this creates a very complex cash management system, including relationships between debtors and non-debtors, which we've detailed uh, in our case summary and other write-ups, and also have shown in a table here provided by the company of its intercompany loans. Thanks, Yash. On this slide, we thought it might be a good idea to just tie together uh, the various elements of the securitization structures that Yash has already mentioned into a diagram for the, the visual learners among us. Uh, there's a lot going on, and we've tried to, to point out uh, essentially how vehicles are moving as well as how cash is moving. Uh, all errors and omissions are ours, uh, particularly when it comes to the documentation. This is just sort of the, the big picture. These are the, the things you need to have in place. Uh, so if you start off in the lower left-hand corner, the key, uh, just using uh, blue outlining to denote a debtor entity, everything else is a non-debtor, I will say for purposes of uh, this slide, generally, unfortunately, we haven't distinguished between non-debtor affiliates and uh, true third parties, but the, uh, the non-debtor affiliate SP is sort of notated in uh, relevant individual entity boxes if, if there isn't a different color scheme. Uh, then back to the idea of tracking vehicle versus cash movements, we just tried to, to note that with different arrows, again, from the perspective of the ABS notes. So going through the flow, if you start over on the right side uh, near the number one, the SPE, that is the issuer of ABS notes, will take those notes proceeds, as, as Yash just noted. Uh, eventually, it will use them to buy vehicles. First, those proceeds will be lent uh, via, in this case, because we're talking about uh, two affiliates of Hertz, uh, an intercompany note, and then those proceeds uh, make their way to manufacturers in exchange for vehicles, uh, both program and then non-program, or sometimes referred to as risk vehicles, as Yash mentioned earlier. Then the vehicle owner um, and the, the borrower or the issuer under the intercompany note um, will lease those vehicles pursuant a master operating lease over to the entities on the left side of the page um, various debtor operating subsidiaries, uh, which may be not only lessees, but perhaps the servicer under the operating lease. And then in certain instances, such as the Donlin uh, fleet leasing business, uh, third-party uh, entities are actually the lessees. Um, and so under the, the master operating lease, lease payments will move from the left side of the page uh, back through the uh, through the lessor, and then the lessor uh, through the intercompany note has obligations to uh, make payments to the ABS issuer that will then uh, make principal and interest payments on those notes. And if you're still with me, uh, if you look at sort of the 
the lower center entities, manufacturers, and used vehicle buyers uh, when it's time to offload uh, a vehicle at the end of its lease term. Uh, some are sold to uh, third parties through uh, various channels. Uh, certain program vehicles will go back to manufacturers. Uh, and there, there are certain uh, vehicles that may be sold actually by uh, debtor affiliates. So Sean just ran through the broader AVS structure. And really quickly, we just wanted to show an illustration of one specific aspect, which is the mark-to-market or true-up concept. It has been referenced a lot in the debtor's filings and first day hearing. And um, so as you can see in our assumptions, we assume an 80% loan to value, which is using figures disclosed by Avis in an investor presentation last month. And Hertz certainly could be different, but and this is just an example. And also we use a 25,000 average purchase price for vehicle, which is again, simply an assumption for illustration purposes. And the depreciation payment per month of 1.67% is based on our read of the maximum scheduled depreciation charge required pursuant to the master lease agreement. And so with these numbers, uh, 25K purchase price, 80% LTV, you can see the ABS purchase price per unit and um, total across Hertz's U.S. fleet. So based on these figures, uh, the monthly ABS depreciation payment across the fleet would be uh, roughly $158 million based on that 1.67%. Then, assuming an 18-month holding period for the average vehicle, we get to an ABS residual value uh, on the fleet of $6.6 billion. And if a 1% drop is assumed, that <clears throat> comes out to roughly a $66 million hit um, based on this true-up mechanism. Now, CFO... Jameer Jackson has said that a 1% drop would result in a $75 million true-up for Hertz. So these numbers aren't not, are not meant to tie out to that, just meant to illustrate our understanding of how this true-up mechanism works. And if we were to change the ABS LTV to a higher percentage, for example, meaning there's less equity cushion on the ABS, or decrease the holding period, this would inc increase the estimated true-up payment, however. And now I'm going to hand it back to Sean to finish off the rest of the slides. I won't run through the entire structure again, but just wanted to put up uh, an adaptation of the basic schematic from a few slides back with the details on the U.S. ABS program uh, structure, which is, Josh noted, has approximately $11 billion outstanding and is by far the largest securitization structure. So if you look at the two boxes uh, in the upper part of the slide center and then the upper right, uh, these are sort of the two non-debtor affiliated uh, entities that, uh, that really drive things for Hertz. Upper right-hand corner, Hertz Vehicle Financing 2 LP, uh, referred to as HCF2, the ABS issuer, and the uh, holder of the intercompany note issued by the entity in the middle Hertz Vehicle Financing LLC, HVF. So HVF versus HVF2 distinction, critical. Uh, HVF is uh, not only the intercompany note issuer and the entity that uh, goes out and purchases vehicles, it is also along with uh, an entity called rental car Finance LLC, uh, the owner of the vehicles. And then it is the lessor under the master lease. Uh, moving to the left-hand part of the slide, lessees under the master lease include the Hertz Corporation. And then DTG Operations, Inc. is also a lessee, and that is uh, an entity related to the dollar thrifty sort of non for its branded operations. And then the, uh, the master lease is the, the one that we've sort of been referencing and will continue to reference is uh, called the Series 2013 G1 Master Motor Vehicle 
operating lease and servicing agreement. In addition to the HVF2 structure, as noted on Yasha's capital structure slide, a few slides back, the company has a number of other vehicle-backed debt facilities, whether securitizations or other revolving credit facilities. We won't go through all the details, uh, or, or else we'd be here all day. But just a, a quick note that the general principles we've just talked about generally hold up, although there are certain variations depending on business models. For example, the Donlin Fleet Management and Leasing Subsidiary, uh, because leases are with uh, third-party lessees, there's, a, there's just not a, a, a debtor lessee in the way that there is under the HVS2 facility. Uh, similar in Europe, because you're talking about a number of jurisdictions all subject to the European ABS program and the European vehicle notes, you just have uh, additional entities in certain capacities, such as vehicle owner, lessee, et cetera. First was in court for the first time yesterday. Uh, the first day hearing, there were no major formal objections. However, uh, certain of the U.S. ABS program note holders started laying out some of their positions on the case. Several of them also filed statements ahead of the first day hearing. Uh, the debtor's main presentation brought up a number of points about their business and plans going forward. Council noted that in terms of fleet management, which is obviously a, a key issue in the case. The company canceled every new vehicle order for 2020, returned as many vehicles as possible. Um, later in the hearing, uh, council noted that contrary to some allegations from certain of the ABS uh, stakeholders that the debtors had not um, taken appropriate action to reduce their fleet size. Uh, the debtors mentioned that there would be approximately 150,000 more vehicles in the fleet currently uh, without these these actions. And the debtors are looking at uh, looking at how to continue to reduce the fleet. The operating lease, master operating lease for the U.S. ABS program, uh, also came up on several occasions. Important distinction. The vehicles themselves are not property of the debtor's estate. They're owned by non-debtor, as we discussed a few minutes ago. However, uh, unexpired leases are property of the debtor's bankruptcy estate. So to the extent that they're debtor lessees, uh, the automatic stay would apply to all of uh, lessors' typical remedies, uh, including collection efforts or recovery of property. So it's, um, again, sort of a, a two-step process, but still still some insulation for the, the debtors as lessees. There's a discussion of the monthly rent under the operating lease, which um, consists of base and variable rent, base just scheduled depreciation. There's a note from the debtors. That's about $300 million per month. Uh, variable is just interest that ultimately makes its way back to payment of the ABS notes and uh, certain other charges, some of which get netted back. And then, uh, as discussed, the uh, the big element is currently the uh, depreciation true ups based on used vehicle resale values, uh, which was would have been 135 approximately $135 million in the April 27 payment that the debtors did not make. And the debtors said, we anticipate this to increase. Uh, the debtors also brought up Bankruptcy Code Section 365D5. We'll get to this in, in more full detail in a minute, but it just governs uh, executory contract, well, unexpired leases of personal property and noted that Hertz is likely to pursue the equities of the case doctrine that would allow the debtors to come to the court and ask for a reduction in payments otherwise due. We, again, we'll get back to that in a moment. Certain of the ABS notes, stakeholders said the uh, 
well, made the point that the debtors are effectively leasing the vehicles uh, without paying for them. Fair point. Uh, and then there was a comment later in response to the debtors' equities of the case comment that, uh, of course, from the uh, the perspective of EABS notes, not particularly equitable to continue using the vehicles without paying for them. Also, just several hours after the first day hearing ended, Carl Icahn filed a Form 13D uh, noting that uh, Icahn and various affiliates had sold out of their nearly 40% equity stake in Hertz uh, on Tuesday. Looking ahead, treatment of the master operating lease will be uh, central to uh, any resolution or future plan in the cases. Uh, all discussion and disclosure so far have been couched in terms of Bankruptcy Code Section 365B5, uh, which is just sort of quoted uh, more in full here uh, and is, is noted by the various parties at the first day hearing. Uh, the general rule is that after a 60-day breathing period from the petition date, uh, an unexpired lease of personal property, the debtor must timely perform all obligations uh, until the lease is assumed or rejected. And then as debtor's counsel brought up, uh, there's this you know, exception to the general rule unless the court, based on the equities of the case, orders otherwise. So the, the debtor's you know, kind of flag, they would be looking at that as a way perhaps to uh, appeal to the, the court's equitable powers to uh, make reduced payments. Uh, and it's interesting that the equities have already started to seep into the discussion a little bit, even if not directly. Uh, there have come up a number of times now in statements by certain of the ABS note holders in both their written statements and in court that, well, you know, these these financing structures have permitted the company to get much more favorable financing for years than it otherwise would have. Uh, you know, kind of hinting that uh, not particularly equitable to let them just tear things up now. Uh, and then the obligations that would come due after 60 days would be administrative, administrative expense claims. Uh, a couple problems there to highlight, uh, you know, facing those claims uh, in order to emerge from Chapter 11. The debtors note in the first day declaration that in the ordinary course, they would be able to reduce their lease burden and generate cash to pay obligations by selling down the vehicle fleet. But as long as the used vehicle market is closed, uh, that's not really an option. And then as Yash noted earlier, uh, the uh, the depreciation true up amounts uh, you know the the approximately 135 million dollars that would have been due on April 27th, which in fact related to March. Uh, you know just how have these vehicle prices been trending since March? The debtors say we think things are only going to get worse in terms of the magnitude of true up payments that they would have to make. Uh, so that's that's something you want to see. Uh, during the, the course of the case, if the master operating lease, on the other hand, is rejected, there would be rejection damages claim. And then we'll just kind of highlight this for issue spotting purposes. Uh, anytime you see a, a large, unexpired, long-term master lease situated near financing for whatever assets are being leased, uh, it's, it's worth at least uh, considering the idea of recharacterization. The idea that uh, what the parties say is a, is a lease uh, may not actually be governed by Section 365, which only applies to, quote, true leases. Uh, parties can argue that uh, what is at least facially called a lease should be recharacterized as uh, disguised financing. So then you're looking at something akin to a secured financing where claim amounts would would really tie more to the value of the collateral as opposed necessarily to looking at 
the original lease obligations uh, may be required to make adequate protection payments. And the, the standard here, it's, it's highly fact-intensive inquiry, but courts will look to the economic substance of the transaction. You don't rely on intent or contract language. For example, even though the master operating lease contains a provision that it's a true lease, the very next subsection says if the court happens to find otherwise, uh, the lessees grant a security interest. Uh, in their their rights. So potential downsides, again, to fact-intensive inquiry, uh, anyone familiar with the Windstream versus Unity dispute over a sale leaseback transaction that was in mediation for a very long time, uh, it just, the nature of the inquiry means that it's, it's going to be a lot of litigation, so then you have to think about that uh, expense for the estate. And then on top of that, you could potentially, you know, the, the debtors are reliant on these securitization structures for the financing of all the vehicles that they wind up using. Uh, you know, burn so many bridges and you potentially lose access to um, EDS capital markets. And then one, just one closing point, going back to Windstream for a minute, uh, White and Case, which is debtors' counsel in this case, uh, has had a front row seat in the, the windstream recharacterization dispute. So presumably there's some good, very fresh in-house knowledge about how to think about recharacterization. And uh, even though uh, everything's been couched so far in, in the language of unexpired leases, uh, I think there's, there probably have been at least some internal discussions about uh, looking at recharacterization, even if the debtors never ultimately pursue it. That concludes the slide portion of our presentation. Please make sure you have submitted your questions as we will now switch over to the Q&A portion of the webinar. And remember, a replay of today's presentation will be available on the Reorg Media page within 24 hours. Okay, let's see what questions have come in so far. Um, it looks like we have one here. Sean, I think this is going to be a good one for you. Uh, does the automatic stay apply to the vehicles? Good question. Uh, no, this was a distinction talked about a couple slides ago. Does not because they're held by non-debtor, but it would apply to debtor entities' rights in the leases. So the way I'm thinking about it is that you can't really get to vehicles that are out of lease right now. Okay, got it. Uh, Yash, one for you here. Um, are, are there comparisons or contrasts to Avis, uh, competitor Avis, that made Hertz more vulnerable in this environment? Yeah, sure. So, uh, firstly, Avis has a smaller fleet and thus less ABS debt. So, and even on the corporate side, they're slightly less levered than Hertz is. Um, on the ABS side, Avis has something like $12.5 billion of securitization debt relative to Hertz's nearly $15 billion. And I, I think a key distinction between the fleets is Avis has more program vehicles than Hertz which we kind of explained during the presentation. Um, so that means that Avis is slightly more insulated to unexpected downturns in the used car market, and that will kind of allow them to pay out less depreciation true-up payments relative to Hertz. Um, so just for an example, if using that numerical illustration that um, we showed earlier, if you bring Hertz's non-program vehicles from their 90% to Avis's 80%, and the same math would result in uh, about 12% lower depreciation true-up payments. And, but just a caveat, that's dependent on a lot of assumptions, like what kind of cars are program versus non-program. Are they luxury cars or what's kind of your traditional coupes? Um, but broadly, the more program vehicles you have, the less depreciation true-up is required. Got it. Uh, that's, that's helpful. Uh, this one's definitely this one's definitely legal in nature, Sean. 
uh, what does economic substance mean for recharacterization? Good question. Um, difficult to answer quickly. The idea is that courts will generally look at, uh, you know, sort of all of the facts and circumstances. Uh, there, I mean, there are various articulations of, of that concept, but a big one that comes up is whether the lessor sort of has um, what some people call a quote, meaningful reversionary interest. So you could think about this, for example, um, do you have, actually, a, I'll, I'll turn to a, um, a court case, and, and again, this is just kind of for thinking through the issues, definitely not legal advice. Uh, a 2017 Maryland bankruptcy case, in Ray, Lasting Impressions Landscape Contractors, Inc. It was a landscaping company that leased seven trucks from Ford under a master lease. Um, the court there ultimately found that the vehicles or the, the master lease was in fact a, a secured financing rather than a lease because the uh, landscaper at the end of a 60 month term could pay something like 10% of the original value of the vehicle, um, but then sort of planned on using them for a 10 to 15 year life. So if there's, if there's sort of like a below market repurchase amount option for the lessee, that's one way to look at it. There are other things, um, whether the property or specifically for the lessee's use. That was a fact that came up in Pillow Tech, a leading Third Circuit case, and the, the circuit which the Delaware Bankruptcy Court is in. Um, it really, it really sort of depends on the specific facts. Got it. Thank you, um, Yash. Uh, question. I think maybe we, we touched on this briefly, but what is the LTV ratio on the ABS debt? Uh, sure, Nick. Yeah, you're right. We we briefly touched on it, um, but I can provide some more numbers there. Give me one second. Right. So, um, as we mentioned in the presentation, the U.S. ABS program has roughly $11 billion of debt, and 0.9 to be exact. And as of Q1, they had roughly 520,000 vehicles. But um, in the first day hearing, Tom Loria of White and Case said that was more like 500,000 now. So if you do the LTV there, that represents roughly $21,800 of ABS debt per vehicle. And that's just the U.S. ABS program. Donlin, if you take their $1.6 billion of ABS debt, um, across roughly 200,000 vehicles in the fleet. That comes out to about $8 billion of debt per vehicle. And the international program, if you take um, their roughly $1.5 billion, excluding the euro notes, which are not true ABS, um, across their roughly 150,000 vehicles, that comes out to about 9.3K of um, ABS per vehicle. Thank you. Um, let me just work through here. So another one, this looks like a good one for Sean to just touch on. Uh, are there foreign proceedings uh, in, in the Chapter 11 case? Not yet, no. So the U.S. and the Canadian entities that filed were under Chapter 11. Uh, there are certain of the, the waivers by ABS and other vehicle debt in other jurisdictions uh, were kind of caused by um, cross defaults that would have come from the Chapter 11 filing. But because those entities all sort of waived that potential event of default, everyone else is still kind of out. Although um, the, the debtors have authority to file foreign entities uh, if they decide to at a later point. Got it. Thank you. Hey, Josh, uh, you're coming quick fire here. What, do you know how much of the $852 million in cash is at the debtor entities versus non-filing entities? Yeah, sure, Nick. Um, so just to clarify, if it wasn't clear in the presentation, that debtors specifically, 
um, have reported that the debtor entities have 852 million of cash as of the petition date. So I think that is exclusive of cash at foreign and non-debtor affiliates. And THC or the Hertz Corporation specifically has 580 in unrestricted cash and equivalents. So the remaining, call it 270 or so, I guess, will be spread across the other debt debtor entities. Great, thank you. Um, this one, I think, kind of goes to both of you, really, uh, regarding the, uh, you know, the, the ABS holders. Uh, the question is, in your best estimation, do you think the MTN and the VFN ABS holders will push for a rapid liquidation of cars? Uh, therefore depressing prices, but getting cash now, or are they more likely to consider kind of an orderly liquidation over time? Um, I, I can start with that one, and then I'll flip it to Sean to add anything. I, I think it's tough to say. We definitely don't know for sure, but we kind of got a brief sense into their thinking with Barclays and um, Georgia Bank's filings uh, a couple of days ago. They both were kind of urging the company to start defleeting. And uh, during the first day hearing, Tom Loria was saying, was taking more of a deliberate approach, I guess. They said that the, they've already gone through some defleeting, but they're trying to figure out the proper way to do it further rather than, I guess, flooding the market with a bunch of cars, which wouldn't be good for both parties, uh, I imagine. But we don't. We certainly don't have any exact numbers or what the proper vehicle amount would be. Yeah, th thanks, Josh. I would just add to that that the I mean the debtors really bear the risk from a more rapid liquidation. Uh, if that if that were to depress prices, because then that would just result in a higher amount of depreciation true up claims the estates would have to pay. So I I think. Exactly what Yash said, they've kind of said in their first day papers and yesterday at the first day hearing, hey, we looked at what we could do that would be minimally disruptive first, canceling new vehicle orders, um, returning vehicles, I guess, as they're presumably as they're coming off um, expiring lease terms. So I, I would think, you know, there's, there's sort of a incentives for both parties to not really push for uh, too rapid of a liquidation, but the debtors, I think, would definitely be more incentivized to, to take a slower approach. Deal. Thank you, uh, Sean. I'll, I'll follow up uh, going in a slightly different direction here. Question for you. Um, are the bond guarantors also the lessees under the ABS uh, financing? So to take it backwards, the two lessees under the U.S. ABS program, uh, the Hertz Corporation, which is a, a debtor, OPCO, and I uh, forget what it's called. There's another entity essentially for dollar thrifty purposes, D, uh, DTG Operations, Inc. The lessees under the, the ABS are guarantors of the U.S. Uh, senior notes as well as the the secured obligations on the U.S. side. And then there's actually, I would refer you to a chart in the debtor's first day pleadings that we captured in the reorg case summary that went out um, on the 26th that has uh, for each debt instrument, uh, primary security obligor detail, because the Hertz Corporation guarantees a lot of non-U.S. debt as well. That's great. Thank you. Um, Yash, one for you here. Where does the depreciation true up show on the income statement and or the cash flow statement? Thanks, Nick. Yeah, sure. I can take that one. So it, it shows up on the income statement. It's bundled or grouped, I guess, with a line item they call vehicle depreciation and lease charges. And in the 10Q and 10K, I believe they break up the components of this. Um, in the income statement, it's just one line, but they also have a separate note or, or schedule where they break up the components into um, typically three different parts. Depreciation of revenue earning vehicles, uh, which is where the true up would show. 
and then also loss on disposal of vehicles and rent paid for the vehicles. Cool. Thank you. Uh, give me one second here as I work through these. Um, Sean, here's a here's a tough one, uh, or <laughs> tough for me at least. Uh, how would the master lease damages claim be calculated were it to be rejected? Were the you know the the master lease to be rejected? Yeah. Um, oh boy. Uh, can I can I get back to you now? Uh, thinking about it, I guess you you start from the date of rejection and work backwards. And then if you think about the amounts that would have been due up to that uh, rejection date uh, to the extent that any of those claims haven't been paid, um, you would you would think through what are you know what are the monthly amounts due um, between base depreciation and then the the true ups is obviously where there's you know numbers are much more subject to change. Uh, but that's that's kind of how I would back into it, at least generally. And then uh, the general principle, those claims uh, I think would likely be unsecured. That's yeah, that's that's what I've got for now. But uh, definitely still in the, the early stages of working fully through the the various outcomes. Well, I'm putting you, we're putting you, we're putting you on the spot here. Uh, Yash, one, one for you. Um, explaining the difference between program vehicles and non-program vehicles. The question is, what is the risk to auto manufacturers uh, regarding the two, the two types? So, regarding program vehicles versus non-program. Sure. Um, yeah, we briefly touched on that, uh, but just to kind of. Add, add some more color to that. Um, program vehicles um, are essentially agreements or vehicles under agreements that the company enters into with the auto manufacturers, pursuant to which the manufacturers guarantee a certain level of depreciation. And anything beyond that, uh, the manufacturers um, effectively guarantee or they, they would be on the hook for it. And non program vehicles, also called risk vehicles, imply that. The risk for greater than expected depreciation is the company's responsibility. And so, yeah, uh, if you look at it, Hertz versus Avis, I mentioned Hertz has roughly 90% um, non program vehicles, whereas Avis has 80%. So, I think um, if, if you're an auto manufacturer, you have more exposure uh, in the situation of Avis's fleet, given their higher percentage of program vehicles. Uh, relative to Hertz. Got it. Thank you. Uh, more here. I think this uh, Sean good one for you. What happens after 60 days? Uh, will payments have to resume? So I think I think the question is referring to you know the, the, the payments, the lease payments. Um, right. Sean, yeah, that that's one? the. Yep, that's the the general rule under uh, the relevant section of the bankruptcy code. Although there's the exception that uh, you know, a, a debtor could seek relief from the court, um, essentially bal balancing you know the the equities um, in order to attempt to pay less. And they, that's what counsel said yesterday. They you know hey if it comes to it we may just try to seek court approval to pay less than we otherwise would have to. Got it. Thank you. Uh, question for both of you. For the, for the true up payments, uh, is fair value of cars me measured monthly or on a trailing 12-month basis? Uh, so my understanding is that's measured monthly and Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe, um, for example, the payment that was due on April 27th is related to uh, the rent and fair value true up required in March. So it's kind of a one-month delay. 
Yeah, that's that's right. It's on a monthly basis. Um, yeah, I'll I'll leave it at that. Um, this, this one maybe maybe calls for a little more um, kind of uh, I guess a bit of speculation. But but uh, if one of you guys can able to answer this, uh, would the ADS creditors be able to grab international unsecured value? Um, so. I can start with that, Sean, and you can add whatever you see fit. So just purely based on the org structure, all of the internet or all of the European entities, um, the ABS entities and the operating entities, as we mentioned, are housed under Hertz Holdings Netherlands, and the equity of HHN flows directly up to Hertz International Limited, which is wholly owned, and then that equity flows directly up to Hertz Corp. So there's no kind of U.S. ABS that are um, involved in, in, in that flow, as we can tell for now, at least. Um, but, yeah, just based simply on the org structure that the company filed, that's that's my read. Yeah, that's generally correct. I mean, the uh, the ABS structures, too, are, are sort of set up. They're designed to be bankruptcy remote and... So other than uh, you know the Hertz Corporation sort of giving a number of guarantees, uh, you know the idea is you're sort of you're seeking a recovery on the vehicles in your specific box or uh, series of, of related boxes as opposed to from other places uh, generally in the structure. Thanks, guys. A um, couple more, still, still a few more here. Um, Josh, uh, this one kind of comes back. I think we've touched on it a little bit, but maybe um, you can you can kind of restate and, and add some color. Uh, does Avis and other rental car companies use the same or different financing structures for their fleets? If different, how so? Uh, sure, Nick. So. Um, not too too deep into the weeds on the ABS, but uh, as far as I know, they use broadly the same ABS financing structure where they have special purpose entities um, and they raise ABS, transfer the vehicles to the operating entities. Um, I guess some of the main differences we've touched on a couple of times already being the differences in uh, fleet size and also program versus non-program vehicles. And... Yeah, I think that's definitely an interesting point, given this is a pretty unprecedented case and um, structure as far as I know. So seeing how this whole structure gets treated, how this case shakes out, and we'll have a lot of implications for kind of the vehicle ABS financing market broadly. Awesome. Thank you. Um... All right, looking through the queue here. Uh, so this question looks like to be another kind of a bit of a toss-up if one of you want to grab it. Uh, so the Hertz Corporation is the only debtor obligor on the U.S. ABS. Does this mean a lease rejection claim would only be at uh, the Hertz Corp? And secondly, if there is a recharacterization issue, is, is the Hertz Corp or THC the only debtor on the hook, you know, under under a potential recharacterization? Uh, the way I'd look at it, so the Hertz Corp, yes, is a is a guarantor is a yeah a guarantor of um, other lessees, and then it is also itself a lessee. So um, from the, the disclosures I've seen, the only two lessees, uh, the master operating lease, of course, sort of has a provision for adding other uh, lessees, but I, I don't think that's been used necessarily. The Hertz Corp and then DTG operations is the other lessee. So I think uh, if you were to 
try to recharacterize, those would be the two entities uh, where things would shake out. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Sean Yash, thank you very much, uh, both of you, for your, for your time. Um, that's all the time we have for uh, questions for today. Uh, I know we, we left some outstanding, and we'll do our best to follow up uh, on those remaining questions offline. If you have a few minutes now, please take the survey uh, that will appear on your screen. Uh, your feedback is very important to us, and thank you, everyone, so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you very much.